Hello there, everybody, and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly uh, virtual roundtable where we discuss all things Beatles, uh, their history, what's going on today, and what may be happening in the future. And uh, in fact, we're going to be doing a, a little a little bit of that for uh, for much of this episode. Uh, I'm Al Sussman from Beatle Fan Magazine, and I'm here with my three co-hosts. First of all, uh, the host of the syndicate. Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing, Ken Michaels. Hey, Ken. Hey, Al. Hey, everyone. And our resident musicologist, a uh, longtime reviewer for uh, classical music for the New York Times and still doing that ta- the, those kinds of duties for uh, the Wall Street Journal and various other, uh, various other places. Plus, he's also kind of like the, the Beatle guy at, uh, at those, uh, those aforementioned publications as well, and that's Alan Cozen. Hey, Alan. Hey, Al. How are you doing? And hello, everyone. Good. And out in San Francisco, uh, or near San Francisco, our uh, our resident, you know, our resident Beatles Beatles reporter, you could say, he's a freelance uh, reporter these days for uh, for Billboard, and for various other uh, uh, online and print publications, and that's Steve uh, Marinucci. Hey, Steve. Hey, Al. Hello, everyone. Now uh, we are uh, we are recording this um, just a few days before the official release of the Beatles live at the Hollywood Bowl, and um, uh, we did uh, we have spoken about it um, over the course of the last uh, the last few shows, but I figured that since the the album drops is released whatever however you want to put it uh is released uh basically right after this uh this show basically is uh made available and then uh, as a podcast and also airs on uh some of our other uh, affiliates uh it might be it might be appropriate it might be timely to uh to Take a look at the album itself, especially um, uh, especially in comparison to the 1977 uh, version and the various uh, bootlegs that have come out over the years, and also and to see if uh, basically if it's uh, if it's worth all of the all the excitement that's been been going on these uh, these last few weeks. So I think first. Since uh, uh, Alan has mentioned the fact that he has done a, um, uh, a rather extensive comparison of uh, the new release, plus also the various bootlegs and the 1977 uh, LP, I figure we'll uh, we'll start with Alan and see what uh, what his thoughts are. Okay, well. I wrote a review for the Wall Street Journal that will be out probably around the time this podcast is made available. And um, I thought that what I should do, since you know it, it's a good excuse to do it, is really round up all of those sources. So I found – I mean I, I have a million Hollywood Bowl bootlegs. I mean it, it was one of the earliest bootleg Beatles shows, actually. Right. But, you know, these days, um, all three shows, I believe, are out on bootleg in stereo. Um, people have done speed correction. People have done some EQing, fixed up the sound. And so there are actually, you know, quite good versions of it out. And, you know, one of the things I've been seeing in print articles about, you know, this album coming up and about the eight days a week film. And, you know, it's gone on for quite a long time is that people in the press sort of routinely talk about bootlegs being, you know, really poor sound quality bootlegs, Mm. um, which suggests to me that they have never heard a bootleg in their life because, (laughs) you know, I mean, the Beatles bootlegs, first of all, all the concert bootlegs with the exception of Memphis Mm-hmm. And, you know, and Tony Barrow's handheld right, cassette of Candlestick Park, Park, sure. you know, really are soundboard recordings. And yeah. and even the Tony Barrow one, you know, even though it's a handheld cassette, he's not sitting in the middle of the audience. Um, I listened, no. to, listened to some of that the other day and it's, you know, he's getting mostly the band. You hear the audience screaming way in the background. 
In fact, much farther in the background on the, than on the Hollywood Bowl tapes. Mm. So, you know, what I felt was, I mean, last time, you know, we talked about this, I had heard the files that um, Universal sent of the tracks on the album. And I kind of found it exciting. And that's still true. And um, the reverb, you know, I noted the reverb uh, that they added to it. And it didn't really bother me much. But Comparing it with the bootlegs and the 77, it bothered me a bit more. I mean, there's plenty of reverb on the 1977 release, too. So Mm -hmm. uh, Giles Martin has largely, I think, followed in his father's footsteps there about, you know, feeling that there should be some reverb added. And I can kind of see why. I mean, you know, what, what are you putting out when you put out a live album? Are you putting out just the dry tape or are you trying to reproduce something like the sound as it was heard in the in the venue you know Mm -hmm. and in the venue it probably would have been pretty echoey um but you know so there's some reverb to to give it a sense of place and all that but i don't think it's necessary um the bootlegs all are you know flat in the sense of no reverb and particularly in the announcements between songs um i find that much easier to listen to than the reverb heavy ones which make it sound like they're in you know in a in an airplane hangar and you know <laughs> it, it, it makes it sound tinny actually you know compared with the straightforward recording i i didn't find that it had that negative effect on the songs themselves um although you know it's on the vocals and and if it's on the vocals it actually must be on the instruments too because they only had the three tracks to work with Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh yeah you know it, it didn't bother me as much the other thing is you know giles martin talked about how he had the technology that i think was started during the rock band period to pull out you know from a single track from one of the each of the three tracks pull out instrument or instrumental profiles and i think that works actually reasonably well and particularly with ringo's drums mm-hmm. uh, so in in terms of the comparisons uh it, it really sonically I probably would prefer to listen to the bootlegs, but between this and the 1977 one, I think this is a a notable improvement in in most regards. My issue that I deal with in the journal piece is that, you know, in 1977, nobody was doing archival stuff. George Martin has never really liked these tapes. Um, he he says so in his 1977 liner notes. I mean, he mm-hmm. he's, uh, you know doesn't say he hates them, and he talks about how exciting and all that. But but he just preferred the studio sound, where obviously there's a great deal more, deal more control. And since the arrangements are so similar to the studio arrangements, I, I can kind of see his point. But, you know, you're going to have a Beatles live album, which you should have. Um, you know, what he decided to do was choose the 13 songs I guess he felt best about. And then he sequenced them with Twist and Shout starting the 65 one and Long Tall Sally from 64 ending it so and then in between he weaves the 13 tracks going back and forth between 64 and 65 in a way okay so you have an idealized beatles set a set the beatles never actually played um Mm. you know and i believe if you listen to the you know intros to hard day's night and help one from 64 one from 65 they're they're both they're, they're talking about them both as their latest album. So uh, there are little things like that. But, you know, for me, OK, 1977, no one's doing, as I said, uh, archival stuff. So you have a compilation and OK, it's not the worst thing. Even in 77, to me, it was a little suspect just because you could get a bootleg of at least the 64 shows in those days. I'm not sure. 60 mm-hmm. It was um... None of the, no, all three shows didn't show up until that box set with all, with the, with the three of them. Uh, yeah. And when that, did that come out? God, Might've been no, in the eighties. No. Really? That, that late? Was, 
that was the first time. That was the first time because what was notice, notable about that is, as we've mentioned before, is the the sound issues with the with Paul's uh, mic. Mm. So, right. Mm. Yeah. On the on the August twenty ninth sixty five when the first three songs, um, the mic that George and Paul were sharing is out of the soundboard. Um, so for instance, she's a woman is basically an instrumental until you get to the point where John sings a harmony and suddenly you have just John's harmony. And for twist and shout, you hear John's lead, but you don't hear George and Paul singing. So it's just the first three songs after that. It's, it's okay. Except that Paul's amp is also having some problems too, but the August 30th, 65 one doesn't have any of those problems. Okay. Um, right. And of course, the, the 1964 one is, you know, perfectly fine. So it seems to me that in 2016, where everyone is putting out archival things, it no longer is really acceptable to have a compilation of two shows or, or two set lists from a year apart woven together. Plus, it bothers me that the four songs Giles Martin added to this one are just stuck at the end. And, you know, there, there was no attempt to weave them into the sequence that his father did. Now, weaving them in might have been tough because in 64, as you know, they went directly from Twist and Shout into You Can't Do That. And in right. 65, they did the same thing with Twist and Shout she's, as a woman. She's a woman, yeah. So where mm. would you weave in You Can't mm. Do That? You know, but, you know, you find you're making a set that never happened anyway you find a way and 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 at least it then would have started with twist and shout and ended with long tall sally or maybe even i'm down here's the thing we're so close now to both sets being available i mean they played 24 songs in those two set lists we now have 17 of the 24 of the remaining seven Three are repeats. So you have a repeat of Twist and Shout, All My Love and In Camp I Me Love, I think. Mm-hmm. No, Hard Day's Night. Hard Day's Night in Camp I Me Love. And the rest, you know, the other four, you know, If I Fell, I'm Down. I um, can't remember the other two. Of, hey, I Feel Fine. Um, and one other slips my mind at the moment. Uh, but those four are not represented at all. It seems to me that, you know, whatever arguments you could make about the casual fan, which, you know, I don't care about the casual fan fundamentally, but I also feel that the, <laughs> the casual fan could could stand hearing Hard Day's Night and Twist and Shout twice. You know, I don't think that any of them would have a problem with that. And it just seems to me that you're going to get this close to it. You might as well just have the 64 sequence, the whole 64 show. And then for 65, either just give the August 30th show or maybe go back and forth between the 29th and 30th, whichever takes you feel are best, and have Mm. one of the 65 shows. They would both fit on one CD. And, you know, that seems to me to be the the proper way to do it in 2016, the way archival things are done now. You know, everybody else has a concert album out that has their whole concert in the way they played it. And it just seems to me sort of a Shonda that the Beatles don't. (laughs) Well, except that in this particular case, it's obvious, especially because of the fact that the cover is a you know is the is a reproduction of the poster for the movie it's obvious that this is being released as a companion to the movie right so it's not being released as a as an archival release it's being released as kind of like a mainstream companion it's a companion to the film but it's like most of this stuff isn't in the film right Mm. it's so um, if you're going to have if you're going to have a film about the Beatles touring years, maybe a more proper companion would be here's what their 1964 and 65 sets were like, mm-hmm. you know, if not a 1966 set, too, which would make sense as well. Mm-hmm. Could have made it a double CD and had something from 63 and 66 and well, really had their touring years represented. As a matter of fact, we probably should, since you mentioned the fact that most of the live Beatles bootlegs over the years have actually been, you know, pretty pretty good quality, mm-hmm. taken from, as you said, soundboard 
basically soundboard or at least um, uh, PA uh, sources. It should be noted that though that the you know that the Hollywood Bowl shows are the only ones that were actually recorded uh, with in, in, in as we know now in three track. Right. Right. Uh, I, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong that none of the other shows say, well, you Shea know, was, Phil- Shea was recorded in stereo. Um, OK. Mm-hmm. Not sure how many tracks, but at least two. Um, right. But of course, Shea, Shea, the Shea recording is very problematic for a number. Of yes. Weeks. Yeah, exactly. Right. Alan, Alan, what was the purpose behind three tracks as opposed um, to that- two or four? You know? Uh, that was three tracks was just what Capital was using. Uh, I remember, you know, if you read George Martin's very first, first of his several autobiographies, he talks about traveling to the Capitol Tower and going to a Sinatra session mm-hmm. um, back, you know, and and was, you know, just impressed that they had a three track recorder when he was recording in mono. So it, it could just be that I mean I'm I'm sure that by the time EMI had four track Capital must have had four track too but maybe their portable equipment was was only three track don't know mm-hmm. but for for a while that was their standard okay. that's yeah that's very possible mm-hmm. yeah yeah right because for instance the Hard Day's Night album was the first one that was actually recorded on four tracks right. Except for the final uh, session of with the Beatles, ah, you're right. So I want to hold your hand, and this boy were four track, and mm-hmm. money was four track, but the rest ah. of that was, was two track. Was two track, right? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, In- hmm. very interesting. Uh, Steve, let me hear your your thoughts. Well. Um, basically, I mean, they, they there isn't really much they could have done with the tapes because of the conditions that was recorded under then. I mean, as opposed to now, obviously things would have been a lot different. I did um, disagree with you, Alan, on the point that all the Beatles concerts were recorded um, in um, soundboard. Uh, soundboard. Uh, that I remember, I know there were a co- at least several. Rome is one of them that I can think of. Okay, yeah, right. No, Rome was one of them. I mean, there are some that are out there that aren't soundboard. Not all of them are. And I, I believe that there's actually a couple of uh, American ones that aren't either. But then, but then again, I mean, there's also some great ones. The Houston one is right. is one that. And and to that end, I really, you know, the fact that they didn't, I I, I agree with just about everything you said about, you know, the fact that they probably should have put the whole thing on there at this point. Uh, I mean, a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about this, I said, you know, it's great that they're finally putting this out and that's probably what they did. But uh, I, I agree that I think it would have been a good idea to do the full shows, which leads me to think that they will. And I still, I, 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 there has been no indication of that. The fact though, that they're digging out Chase stadium really leads me to believe that, something else is coming uh i don't know when but and hopefully sooner rather than later but uh i really well, we do know that there are going to be dvd extras because ron howard has addressed that in one of the interviews that he did this past week mm-hmm. uh so it's conceivable that perhaps among the dvd extras might be perhaps a uh, you know complete shows I know that at, at least one person I talked to said that uh, a friend of theirs who got interviewed is in the extras. She's not in the movie. Uh, she's not in the movie. Yeah, so, the, the mm. only stuff for extras that we know about are, are interviews so far. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, Steve. I don't know if I don't, I don't want to interrupt your thing, but I don't know if you noticed that no have have seen this, but there apparently is a different cut of the film coming out in Japan. With extra stuff about the Japan. Oh, no, really? Yes. Yeah, so maybe that stuff will be in the DVD extras too, or maybe the DVD will have a, you know, a complete thing with everything that's come out everywhere. Who knows? I can, I can, oh. I can just, every, I can just hear everyone listening to the show groaning like, <laughs> no. God, yeah. that's so now we're gonna have to buy the Japanese import too. Yes. Where did you hear well, about that, they, Alan? Um, a uh, there was a Japanese news source who uh, 
was quoted by Roger Stormo. I'm not sure if Roger Stormo has published it yet, however. Mm. I imagine he must have because he publishes everything he hears. So. Yes, this is true. <laughs> yeah. But I haven't looked. Uh, this was in a, a, a private communication. Hmm. Hmm. That's, that's, uh, hmm. That, yeah, that obviously the, the shows in Japan were the, the Tokyo shows from the beginning of uh, July of, of 66 are among the best quality Beatles concerts from a sound standpoint, not from a musical standpoint, which is the right. problem. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I find, I almost find that uh, that's uh, given the, given the source, I almost find that a little difficult to believe. I, I, I would be skeptical that they would do that. I mean, that would really, that would really tick a lot of people off. And I, I can't see, I can't see them yeah, bending to the, to the, I mean. Uh, Steve, but you know, every single album that comes out these days and for the last 15 to 20 years, the Japanese version has had cuts that have come out in Japan only. So this isn't that different than that. All they've done is extend, you know, the Japanese section for Japan. It, it doesn't sound that un, unlikely to me. I, I can't see that. I mean, yeah, here it is. It's it's on his site, special oh, edition sure. for Japan. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure it is, but I I would still be skeptical about that. Uh, I would. He I'm quotes. Gonna, he quotes Yossi Nas. You know, Yossi. Oh, Nas I know. Who, I know who. I know who it is. Yeah. I've okay. Heard, I've heard. Uh, saying that his it has been announced in Japan that the Japanese edition will be different. Hmm. In what respect? Um, that it will have more of the Japan footage from '66. Mm, okay. Um, says we don't know how much uh, is in the international version, but um, yeah. And then from there, he goes on speculating, well, what if everybody does this? What if the Australian version has, you know, more Australian stuff? And, you know, that could get very chaotic. Um, but I, I kind of suspect that the Japanese market has the clout for that, that none of the other markets do. And it's not like the U.S. market doesn't have clout, but from what we've read in the early reviews, it's so skewed towards the U.S. anyway, it would be hard to, to make it more so. Hmm. Steve, uh, since uh, we kind of got uh, sidetracked there, did you <laughs> did you have any 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 other thoughts on uh, on the I'm, album itself? Well, I'm, I mean, I, I you know, like I've said before, I'm glad this is coming out. I I I'd, I'd like what Alan said though about uh, having the full sets. I like I said, I still think there is going to be more, and maybe this is maybe the Japanese thing is all part of it. Maybe they're, you know, they're going to make it so collector crazy they're going to really go for the collectors by you know having multi editions god wouldn't that be horrible um, right. I, but I, but I, from uh, from but from a listener's standpoint what did you think of the set itself i liked it i liked it i've been listening to it a lot i, I agree that the four songs tacked on at the end kind of sound, sound like they were tacked on at the end <laughs> but uh, still i'm i'm glad this is finally out and i'm uh, you know i mean it's this thing should have come out years ago well, especially yeah. since since I know you've been a fan of of the Hollywood Bowl album for a very long time. Yeah, I I've had, so. I, I, bought, I bought a bootleg uh, a bootleg. Well, I've had you know I mean I've had a lot of the the bootlegs over the years, but I bought one off of Amazon within the past couple of years that had all the Japanese inserts and all that stuff in it, and it was great having it. I mean you know so I'm I'm glad that they're finally doing it. That's all. There's not mm -hmm. much more to say than that. Okay. Okay. We could Ken, talk about the booklet. Yeah. Okay, ah. yeah. yeah, we could we could talk we'll get about back to well, that for, later. Yeah, we'll get yeah, let's get back to that because I want to get Ken's thoughts on the the album itself. Well, I only have the uh wave files right now as we right. speak, but um mm -hmm. I love the sound of this. I think it has a lot more presence to it. It has to me a warmer sound. Uh, from mm -hmm. what I remember about the album. And I, I have to admit, I haven't played my vinyl copy in ages, but when I do listen to the Hollywood Bowl, there's a bootleg that Yellow Dog put out on one single disc, and I usually right. refer to that one. So um, I'm very pleased with this. I think the, the sound has... the it's There's much more presence, I think, from the Beatles, and I don't mind the reverb. And as Alan was reminding us, there was reverb on the album. 
But um, no, I just I think it has a very fuller sound. I hear the band much clearer. I do notice that the uh, the screaming was brought down a little bit, but mm-hmm. not to the point where it doesn't capture the excitement from the audience. And right. I know that. Um, you know, and we had Kid O'Toole on to comment about this, uh, you know, a few shows ago. She mm-hmm. still wanted the screaming because that captures so much of the thrill and the excitement from the audience. And that's part of the enjoyment in, in listening to this. To not hear the screaming, to some degree, I think would be a bit of a disappointment because you're hearing it, you know, in the full context of how the fans heard it and hearing right. the, the screaming, too. You know, that was, that was, the, that was a Beatles concert. Yeah. You know? But I think it was a, the right balance there in bringing down the screaming a bit, but not too yes. much. So mm-hmm. I think a uh, good job was done overall. But, you know, kind of what we said in the past, I think, still applies here. It's never bothered me in 1977 when they bounce back and forth from the 64 show to the 65 shows. I do agree with Alan. I would much prefer that they were two full, complete shows. And I don't understand why the four songs that are not represented from those two tours are not on here if it had mm-hmm. anything to do with the sound quality like i love if i fell from the 64 mm-hmm. show i don't i i can't understand why that wouldn't be on here because i think that george martin probably felt that john is like showing some vocal strain on the high notes there and i think he's mm. being protective you know I probably know. it doesn't bother <laughs> me none <laughs> of course not yeah but uh, i'm down you know i have What's the problem yeah. with I'm down? You know, um, I want to be your man should be on there. That was um, the fourth. <laughs> no, there was um, there's one other one. I feel fine. I feel, I feel fine. fine. Yeah, yeah, that's not on. Mm-hmm. There. So um, I can't understand why, even with the imperfections, it doesn't matter. It's the Beatles. It's part of history. And mm-hmm. we don't really know as much as we'd love to see more live stuff come out. If this might end up being the only live release. And if it is, as far as audio is concerned, why not have every song represented? So, um, and I do agree that those four songs tacked on at the end, it kind of falls flat with Babies in Black. As much as I love the song, why make that the last song in the set? It just doesn't make any sense. Mm. I I love having four bonus tracks, don't get me wrong. I'd rather have those than not have them at all. But to end like that, it just doesn't seem to make sense. You know, they would never close their concert with Babies in Black. So, right. um, you know, but I love the sound. The sound is the bonus here. And I think that uh, they did a great job on that, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, a couple of things about that. Uh, first of all, as far as tacking on the four, the four extra tracks at the end, uh, I, purists, Hollywood Bowl, the Beatles at the Hollywood Bowl purists, <laughs> <laughs> who have been fans of that album since 1977 might say it's it's actually better to have those four tracks separate rather than rather than disturb the actual you know the flow of the of the original album now that i mean that may be devil's advocate okay no, no, <laughs> doesn't you just have a separate CD for four songs. Is that it? No, but uh, but uh, saying that the people would say purists would say that having those four songs at the at the end after the the you know the actual the actual original album ends mm-hmm. is actually the way it should be rather than to integrate the four songs yeah, into well. well you know, as I said, that's, that's a purist. That's a purist point of view. Yeah, it's kind of not a real album, though. I mean, it's a 1977 compilation. It's almost like saying, "Well, I don't like the one album because it's missing some of the songs on the Red and Blue album." Right. You know, I mean, there are other reasons I didn't like the one album, <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that reason wouldn't make much sense, and that's sort of a similar. You know, it's it's like, OK, this is not something the Beatles put together. It's something George Martin put together in 1977. And I, I, it's hard for me to imagine that anybody would prefer less than more. Um, and that if it absolutely had to be a compilation, not a not the two full sets, it mm-hmm. just seems like, you know, what George Martin was after was something like the Beatles concert experience with some kind of flow of the set with Long Tall Sally, or maybe it should have been I'm Down, 
at the end. So I don't know. I mean, with a lot of other uh, groups, like look, let's say Cheap Trick live at Budokan, you know, they put out an album in the, of, of that in the 70s that, you know, it wasn't the whole concert. It was what would fit mm-hmm. on the disc. And then when they right. put out the expanded version, they put the songs back where they were in the show. I can't imagine anybody saying, well, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I kind of liked it the way it was. I want to have less. You know? Except, except, cheap trick is not the Beatles. Yeah, but I don't know. <laughs> so no, it's the same idea. I, and and then that that brings up another thing. Uh, there are there are some people who, from a musical point of view, kind of look askance at this at this album being released as a you know a quote mainstream release as a companion to uh, uh, to the to the film because yeah. of, of the fact that the performances in some cases are not the you know are not the best you know they're not as not as bad as the 66 uh, Tokyo ones but in some cases like for instance you can tell that they're uh, basically racing at breakneck speed through she loves you and i want to hold your hand and can't buy me love which in fact disappeared from their <laughs> from their set after the 64 tour you know it's it's a, it's it's kind of a mark of how how quickly they were moving musically that those songs were kind of old hat to them and there are some people who are saying that from a musical standpoint that a you know that a mainstream release should have better performances but where would that. they get them yeah you know, exactly this is what capital has right yeah um I mean, I'm with those people who say that it's silly to make this a companion album to the Hollywood, to the Eight Days a Week film, right. just because this is and always has been something completely different, and it's all from one show, and the Eight Days a Week film is going to be jumping from show to show, I mean, just by its nature. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not a soundtrack album. It's, right. you know... But and it has uh, it makes to me no sense whatsoever for the. But I talked about this a few weeks ago. But to have the cover be basically the film poster, yeah. You know, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> and uh, and that. Uh, no, go ahead, Ken. This album stood by itself as a major release in 1977. To just c- call it a companion piece is ridiculous. Yeah. It's a part of history. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Right. For how long have people like like Steve been been lobbying for Capital or EMI or Apple, whoever, to to release the Beatles at the Hollywood Bowl? Mm-hmm. You know, a long time now. You know, it's, yeah, and, it's been it's been a, a you know a big hole in the in the catalog. You know, especially when you you know, and and I, I suppose you there are people out there. I'm not sure that we'd all agree, but there are people out there that are saying the same thing about love songs and rock and roll music too. But well, uh, I mean, well, I'm, I'm just saying that that's yeah. possible possibly true at the least maybe rock and roll music but because yeah, love songs is horrible but uh, well i could see rock and roll music only because of the fact that there are some different mixes that george martin did on that album some of those yeah, hotter the, those hotter mixes which are a little bit unique you would but otherwise get, they're you the, those mixes mm-hmm. you wouldn't get those mixes again because they hated the mixes so they would use the remastered versions for sure. You know? Yeah, probably. But also, I mean, if you want to talk about mixes making uh, a compilation le- release legitimate, the British version of Love Songs has Norwegian wood with a centered vocal. So there you go. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, there were, I mean, there are all those, all those examples of Beatles releases from all over the world that have little different things, you know, the hi hat intro to All My oh, Lovin' yeah. that's on uh, an yep. Odeon Greatest Hits collection. And, mm-hmm. you know, that's, uh, it's, and, you know, even some of the stuff that ended up being on the, um, I guess the English version of the Red and Blue albums. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's there's books there's whole books on that. Stuff. Oh sure, 
And actually, actually, I was gonna, I was gonna bring up, and and uh, uh, I mean, since we kind of messed with it, there are a couple of files that people who have been around the internet know about that maybe some of our listeners don't that you can find very easily because I found them yesterday again and download them and they're very helpful and one is um, Joe Brennan's um, Beatles recording variations the other one is um, Anatomy I think it's Anatomies Alan you know which ones I'm talking about right I know about the Brennan. I'm not sure which the second one is. The other one, uh, I don't have. Unfortunately, I left my uh, my iPad in the other room because I have them both on there. Um, but uh, there's yeah, there's two of there's a couple of those. Um, the recording variations though is 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 fantastic. I mean, yeah. and it's it's accurate. They even revised it in '89. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, when the remasters came out. So or when the CDs from not the remasters. Right, the original CDs. My wife just did me a favor. Um, she just brought it over to me. Um, <laughs> thank you. Let me tell you what they are, um, and I will give you because I, yeah, it was. I mean, I've had these. I had these on a computer, and I remember taking them on a, a plane with me and reading them. And uh, they're very helpful. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. One, okay, one of them is the Notes on series by Al, uh, Alan. Alan Pollock. Alan, Alan, Alan Pollock. Yeah. Pollock. I'm sorry. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, which is a great series. That's one of them. I'm, I, I'm sorry if I'm interrupting the whole discussion here. But it's I, okay. I, it's okay. Um, the Anatomies is um, uh, it's a Beatle Anatomy list compiled by Mike Brown. Compiled in uh, the version I have I'm looking at here is 1999, August 1999. Uh, it's A N O M A L Y. Uh, if you're doing a search, and then the um, uh, recording variations is called. Oops. Well, you can search for Joe Brennan. It's called use, mm-hmm. Yeah, Use the Guide to Beatles Recording Variations, and and that that I think is the best thing there. I mean, that is just amazing. I mean, there's been books written on you know mixes and stuff, and mm-hmm. I, I'm looking I'm looking at one on my shelf called Every Little Thing. Coincidentally. Yep. Yeah, that's uh, a good title. Good title. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> There's another one called uh, the Beatles remixes. I think um, I can't see it exactly. Now, every, every little thing is the one by Mitch McGreary, and right. I forget yeah. who his co-author was. And that, that, right. was that was that was a very early. That was one of the earliest yeah. uh, compilations. Right. Of, you know that yeah. one's that one started out as basically a glorified pamphlet. It yes. had that yellow You're, and black cover. Yeah. And the pamphlet I thought actually was much better than the book when the book finally came out, which was one of those Pyrian Press right. yeah. uh, books. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, have, because yeah. to pad it out to be a book, they had to add things like, well, but on the Mexican release, the version is two seconds shorter. And right. you know. If it's two seconds shorter on some foreign release, I don't really care. If yeah. it's two seconds longer, well, that may be different. But, you know, so there was a lot of that, and I found the book a little harder to find the useful stuff in, whereas the the booklet version, you know, maybe better than pamphlet, um, I still use that now and then, you know, just because it's it was it was fun in its time, and, mm-hmm. and they were very comprehensive. Yeah. Yeah. But I, yeah. I, 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 I've been wanting to mention the, at least the Joe Brennan thing here for a long time. And um, so um, thank you for letting me do that. But, yeah, those are, those, are, those are a couple of things that you can find on the Internet for free. And they're well worth you know, having, especially if you're, if you're kind of new and you're really getting in, just getting into it. They're excellent. So. Now, speaking of reading material… Mm-hmm. That brings us to the the rest of the packaging of the Hollywood Bowl release. Very good. Nice little segue, Al. <laughs> <laughs> and it's kind of nice. I mean, apart uh-huh. from yeah. the, the stupid film poster thing, you open it up and there is a reproduction of a ticket from August 23rd and 29th, which I believe actually they lifted from the album labels. From the from the, yeah. Yeah. With a booklet – has um you know it 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 has a couple of reproduced news articles from you mm-hmm. know one was when tickets went on sale and you know everyone was clamoring for tickets and another one fan shrill fans shrill cries greet beatles on bowl stage which is a 
another review, I guess from the LA Times, right? And that was from 65. Uh, I think the other one was from 64. And then there is um, re- George Martin's essay from the 77 one is reproduced in full. Mm-hmm. And there's a very long article by David Frick. That's um, the one I was, I was yeah. uh, uh, going to ask right. about. Yeah. You know, well, it's really interesting. And he has, you know, I mean, a lot of it is he, he writes in a very personal way for he, he uh, obsesses actually about um, things we said today that I think for him is like the heart of this album. And he goes into great detail why. But the other thing he does is, you know, you get the, the sense that his assignment was, um, OK, now relate this to the film. Right. And so mm-hmm. it keeps getting to be about, you know, the film, which the rest of the world knows really has nothing to do with this, except that they're using this as a marketing thing for the film. Mm-hmm. Um, and okay, you know, but it's 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 not a bad essay at all. I kind of mm-hmm. liked it. I'm d- I'm just looking at one of the picture in the middle, uh, and um, it was one of the pictures that uh, they put out with the announcement of the press conference, the Beatles press conference in. Capitol Records, and I didn't. I didn't realize. Um, I guess that's the room downstairs. Yeah, that was one of the rooms that I toured in. Uh, I was going to ask about that. Yeah, now. yeah. Um, but yeah, so that, that's kind of that's interesting. Um, I thought it was funny that he kept promoting the uh, the movie in there and and relating it to that. It was like you know, uh, I mean, to try and you know, plug it that hard, but I mean, well. I mean that's that's basically what you know the, what this is. It is right. a it is a companion. Right. To, I do. I, the that, film. It's nice that uh, the a couple of the pictures are nice. The one of the the old Hollywood Bowl sign is mm-hmm. nice. Uh, that's uh, page uh, one two three four uh, page four, uh, and then the, um, the two the two pictures of the Beatles on stage. The one of them standing, actually singing, and the one on the back cover of them taking a bow. Those are really nice too. But uh, so that's what you get there, you know, with that. Uh, and plus the little card that says the DVD will be out in November. So. Right, which of course has kicked off all kinds of speculation. Even though there's absolutely nothing, <laughs> nothing. Yeah, somebody, somebody asked me today if the. Uh, if the Hollywood Bowl CD was going to be included in the DVD. And I said, I had not heard that, but there's a, there's a, there's a thought. I mean, the, the question that I've gotten multiple times is, is Shea Stadium going to be on the DVD? And to, I, I, and I will say what I've been saying, you know, honestly, I don't know. The reports I've been hearing is it won't, but I honestly can't see them doing that going to that much trouble without doing something with it, either there or somewhere else. And Alan, you had a theory. Okay. Well, you know, I, I agree that it would make sense to do it. And, and it, it, the fact that they're showing it in theaters is almost an indication that they might include mm-hmm. it as bonus material, but the precedent for the way they think um, is the inclusion of the Washington show only in the iTunes downloads right. of the remasters, but not coming out on DVD or anything like that. That seems mm-hmm. to be the, the equivalent of showing Shay only in the theaters. And they're going to do something with Shay besides mm-hmm. just show it in the theaters. Um, and I suspect they may, if they don't put it in this, it probably is because they're holding it out for a separate live dvd set where See, that's that's uh, that's that's my thinking too i mean that uh, that's kind of where i'm you know if they don't do it like you say if they don't do it for the dvd they have to do they have to i mean they've got that they've got japan they've got i mean they well, can do and it. washington you know they and, still need to put out washington in a, in a physical for, well i don't know yeah. maybe they don't need to do it in a physical format but I think they do. <laughs> sure. Mm-hmm. Oh. All those yeah. concerts, all those concerts really deserve to be standalone DVDs mm-hmm. and not just cast aside as a bonus track. <laughs> right. You know. And the thing is, with today, with with you know deluxe packages that are, you know, big bucks things. I mean, it would be perfect to throw together a bunch of the concerts, maybe do one or two or three in a regular package, and then do you know do all the 
Hollywood Bowl, or not all the Hollywood Bowl, because they don't have film on all of them, but they do have right. film on one of them that they could synchronize. They could do Shea, they could do Washington, they could do Granada TV, they could do, there's a whole bunch of stuff they could they could do. So I, I my suspicion is like yours, Alan, that, that maybe they will do something. I'm hoping they at least put something in with the DVD, or at least give, you know, let people know that something is coming. Well, now perhaps one of you or one or all of you can confirm there is a, a report that the version of the Shea film uh, that will be shown in the theaters will be a 30-minute cut, which is obviously much shorter than the, you know, the original Beatles at Shea Stadium film. That was, that was the original. That was the original plan. That was what they said when they made the announcement that it was only going to be the Beatles part, they're not showing all the rest. And in fact, Richard Porter posted today online that he has seen the film in England and it is indeed just the Beatles. So that part is not really a, that really has never been in question Mm. uh, because they, that was the initial announcement that it was only going to be the Beatles. So So. perhaps, and again, this is pure speculation on my part. (laughs) Perhaps I love then, the way. Then, <laughs> he's covering his tracks here. That's all. Exactly, covering something. Um, yeah, covering something very big. That perhaps the thirty-minute cut of the film of the Shea Stadium film might be one of the extras. Because I, I, I don't know. I, I have a tough time imagining them putting the entire Beatles at Shea Stadium documentary on. You know, on as a DVD extra. Yeah, you know, no, with, I, with eight I, days yeah. a week. But per, but I, perhaps I, the thirty minute cut. The thirty minute cut really, of course, is the heart of it. I mean, I don't know that anybody is going to be heartbroken about not seeing Sounds Incorporated and oh, Jay, you know, know. E- even Brenda Holloway and mm-hmm. uh, you know, but King Curtis, King, King Curtis, Curtis. Yeah. Marie yeah, you know. <laughs> well, uh, the Murray the K might be included in the 30 minute cut. I don't know. It's sort of the intro material to the Beatles themselves, right? Uh, not really, because uh, I think he just Ed kind Sullivan. of like, right. It was Ed, it was Ed Sullivan that introduced them. You know, Murray just kind of like introduced the you know the concert itself. Didn't he introduce Ed Sullivan though? No, that was uh, Sid Bernstein. Mm-hmm. Really? Uh, yeah. Huh. Yeah, Murray. Uh, Murray is just there, kind of like at the beginning of the concert, and telling people to, you know, that it's going to be a long evening and relax and right, don't right, don't right. get hurt and all that stuff. And mm. and then I think he introduces uh, I don't know Cannibal and the Headhunters or whichever one of the <laughs> first acts uh, <laughs> uh, was there. I say, yeah, right. Yeah. Hmm. Well, also, though, Steve um, has seen a revised set list, and it looks from the way Steve read it to me as if they're going to do something like they did with the Hollywood Bowl album. Yeah, uh, they they posted a revised set list from what they originally announced uh, a set of uh, uh, website. Uh, hold on. A, a, uh, a revised set list from what? For Shea. Shea Stadium. Uh, for, for Shea, Shea. Stadium. Right, and it has all the songs that we know are on video, which would be Twist and Shout, Feel Fine, Dizzy, Miss Lizzy, Ticket to Ride. Oh, Pat, yes. I, and and she's, a, uh, she's a Woman is what, at the very end? At, in because audio. There's, yeah, because every, there's no... Everybody's, everybody's Trying to Be My Baby is not there. Oh, so. okay. Okay. Well, the, there was, uh, the, supposedly there was no video of Everybody's Trying to Be My Baby. Mm-hmm. Or... Or uh, or she's a woman. Or she's a woman, and mm-hmm. where she's a woman is being placed on that list indicates that it's probably just going to be, you know, the credits. Mm-hmm. Mm, could be. Yeah. yeah. Of course, what they should do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, if they're only showing us the 30 minutes, and they only have right. 50 minutes, because as as uh, uh, Dave Schwenson told us they threw away all the trim. So, right. so all they have is what's in the film, but uh, in the full film. But so we know that they have another 20 minutes or so that we're not seeing in 
the Beatles part of the show, they do have the audio for She's a Woman and and Everybody's Trying to Be My Baby. They should leave those in the set where they go and then just use some of the other footage for for those two songs. Or, you know, and as you know, they're very, very deft at taking film of the Beatles and making it look like they're performing what they're not performing. I mean, on, right. the, on, the, on the one plus DVD, it looks yes. like they're performing uh, eight, eight days, days a week. week. Right. Iro- ironically, <laughs> eight days a week. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so they could probably do some of that plus some of the, you know, the film of people going up the escalator and the helicopter and, and all sorts of other stuff for those two songs. And just let us hear those two songs in context. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm surprised they're not doing. Everybody's trying to be my baby. If they're if they're going to that much trouble to to throw, yeah. but that that must be what they're doing. Like you say, is using doing it over the credits. I I, I guess so because on that list that uh, that you know that you were referencing before that I did see that online, and she's a woman is the last song mm-hmm. listed. So I mean. The, the only explanation would be that it would be over the credits. Yeah. So, so it'll be so, and it'll be a very interesting, very interesting to see how good a how good a copy this is of the Shea film. You know, considering that there have been almost consecutive improvements, it seems like every time it's been shown in some form, whether it was in the anthology or in other, other venues, it seems to have gotten better every time. So it should, it should be very interesting to see how it looks, especially how it looks on a movie screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that the most. (laughs) Yeah. I never saw that on the big screen. So. Right. I mean, the only kind of big screen I've seen it on was, you know, at Beetlefest. Right. You know, but, uh, you know, other than that, it was always on, you know, on TV, mm-hmm. you know, so it, uh, it should be, uh, should be very interesting. And, and, and that's not far away either. That's only, let's say there are going to be, there are going to be previews, uh, well, not previews, premieres on, uh, September 15th. I know in here in the Pittsburgh area where I live, it's going to be playing at a theater in, uh, in Dormont which is a suburb of uh, of Pittsburgh and uh and uh, Alan I think you said that uh you finally have gotten a theater in, up in Portland that's going to yes, be it, Yes at long last it is going to be shown in Portland but for one night only Oh really cuz cuz here it's going to be playing for a whole week oh. Yeah same thing in Connecticut Aha uh-huh. right yeah, yeah. And it seems to, yeah, it seems to differ from city to city. How about out out your way, Steve? It's playing for a whole week. It's playing in Berkeley and in San Francisco. And in fact, I'm just looking at my uh, uh, my emails. Um, I w- I haven't announced it yet. I will be announcing it this week, though, that I will be hosting a screening in Berkeley on Friday on the Friday, the 16th, I believe. Right. Um, so. But uh, um, I, I just uh, looking around on the internet, I just I just found something that I'm going to mention mm-hmm. that uh, uh, Richard Neville, the uh, co- co-founder of Oz Magazine, has passed away. Oh, at age, really? At age 74. So hmm. that was posted by uh, by Richard Porter. So. Uh huh. Um, but uh, there we go. Well, there's, uh, there's somebody else. A little, a little footnote. A little in, footnote there in in Beatle history. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. That's 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 true. Uh, I w- you know I was going to ask about uh, now. Uh, right, you're you're going to be uh, hosting the uh, the showing mm-hmm. uh, the showing in Berkeley. Mm-hmm. Right. It's also playing. It's yeah. also playing in San Francisco. Um, it's not playing in San Jose, from what I recall, which okay. is kind of surprising. Um, Nobody knows the way. There we go. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Oh, you don't uh, know how much that song is hated around here. Oh my god. Oh, I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> they oh, should god. be proud of that song. No. No. Uh, and uh and also I should ask, since two nights after the the premieres or the night after the, the premieres, depending on where you are, uh it'll be debuting on Hulu. How many of you have uh, the three of you have signed up for Hulu? Well, I have. I've had Hulu. Uh, okay. And it's by the way, it's only Shea Stadium will not be on Hulu. 
Shea Stadium is only on in the theaters. On the, the, so, in the theaters, okay. Right, they're only showing the, the, the movie on Hulu. Just showing so. eight days a week. Mm-hmm. And it'll be exactly the same, because I've seen different time uh, figures for how long the film actually is. I've seen 100 minutes, I've, heard, I've seen 95 minutes, I've seen 90 minutes, uh, so... <laughs> Mm-hmm. So I'm not sure, you know, whether there's going to be any any, you know, any difference between what we see in the theater and then what we see two nights later, so to speak, on uh, on Hulu. By the way, have you guys seen the fact that uh, Steve Van Zandt is hosting the New York premiere and they're having sponsored levels for that premiere? <laughs> five five thousand, ten thousand, and twenty five thousand dollars. Now is that for the just the the premiere, just the the first night premiere? It's the first night premiere, but it but what you're sponsoring is you're sponsoring teachers to attend the premiere. I guess to use the uh, because they want this used in the classroom. They're they're giving uh, they're giving curriculum tools so that eight, eight days a week can be used in the classroom. Mm-hmm. Well, that, that so, kind of it. it that's kind of consistent with Steve's uh, um, his uh, past uh, work doing. There was a rock and roll, not rock and roll high school, but something similar to that. I forget the actual name of it. Uh, okay. That he had uh, that he had had uh, was building up a curriculum for uh, a few years back. And unfortunately, I'm forgetting the um, forgetting the details. But so, but it's that's kind of consistent with what Steve has been uh, kind of aiming at for several years now in in you know kind of educating people in the history of rock and roll. Yeah, I, I scrolled down. There's also a one thousand dollar level, but for the three higher levels, you get VIP seats. You get two for five thousand, four for ten thousand, and six for twenty five, and you get red carpet entrances and pre reception credentials. So there's and, and where and where is is this at the IFC theater in no, um, Villa, okay. Village Village East movie theater on Second Avenue in New York City. Oh September, okay. September fifteenth. Ah, right. okay. Mm. Okay, because the because I uh, uh, I originally had heard that the the New York premiere was going to be at the or premiere engagement because I think it was going to be playing for a whole week was at the as I know it from back in my days uh, in the in that neck of the woods the Waverly Theater, which mm. is now the IFC uh, theater. Well, it it, <laughs> it 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 might still be playing there, but it's, yeah, um, I think it it's, is. It's, it's, it's doing, it's doing, and this might be just a one night only deal. Yeah, that so, sounds like a like a you know a benefit of some kind. Ken, you're the closest to it. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm actually going to one that's in uh, Westchester, oh, okay. and then actually, actually, um, I found out after that that there's one in Hartford, which is closer to me. But I'm going to the one uh-huh. in Westchester anyway. So, uh-huh. um, can I mention one thing? Because Please. I'm surprised mm. I'm surprised we haven't done this yet. But there is a website. Yeah. That everyone can go to, which lists all the theaters in the United States that's running it. And yeah. I do have I have the URL for everybody mm-hmm. if they want to check it out. Just go to www. The Beatles eight days a week. Spell out eight, and that's dot com slash us slash book hyphen tickets. So it should list all the theaters and how long it's going to run in each theater. Mm-hmm. And there may also, I think there's also such a listing on the Beatles uh, website, you know, the official, you know, Beatles, www.beatles.beatles.com. Well, that, that, that is attached to the Beatles website. And by oh, the way, it is. I was, I was incorrect, but they have really, they have expanded. There is playing, it is playing in San Jose and it's playing all over the Bay Area. So there are many places, but it's, they've, yeah, they've done a lot of expanding, uh, but if you go to that site, you can get the most uh, the most recent the most recent bookings. And some are playing one day, some are playing two days, uh, some are playing week. So uh, it's playing at, at uh, different lengths um, at different theaters. So you have to you really have to check at the at the website to see how long it's playing. I don't mm-hmm. see it playing longer than a week anywhere. So right, yeah. Yeah, uh, I did. In fact, I'm I'm actually kind of surprised that it's playing a full week 
in certain markets. You know, mm-hmm. because I, I I had heard originally that it was basically just going to be a premiere just that Thursday or Friday night, and then Saturday night, you know, Hulu. And it is playing at IFC for a week, by the way. Ah, right. So okay, yeah, as so. it is as it is out here. All righty. So I think it's this has been a very interesting uh, interesting discussion. We we had covered some of this uh, within the last few weeks, but I figured that was it was perhaps more timely since the album, since the Hollywood Bowl album is being released this week, and the uh, and eight days a week is premiering next week. That uh, that we should uh, you know cover this for for especially for people that'll just be just be getting the album. Over the course of the uh, of the uh, the the next uh, the next few days, so in that uh, in that vein, I guess we should uh, check with uh, each of you and see what uh, uh, if there's anything besides Steve's um, hosting duties <laughs> <laughs> that that need to be addressed. Steve, anything else? Um, no, I mean you can get to me on uh, my email, uh, BeatlesExaminer at gmail dot com. Um, I'm also on Facebook under my name. I have a uh, Beatles news uh, group called Beatles News and Beatles News and Commentary that uh, you're welcome to join and participate in and just watch for my stuff on both uh, Billboard and Access dot com. Axs dot com. Mm-hmm. Alan. Um, well, my Wall Street Journal review of this album is coming out sometime this week. Not sure what day. Um, you can find it at wsj.com. And they're, they're often behind a paywall, but sometimes the first few days of a story, it's sort of out there in the open. Um, and I also have found that um, sometimes, you know, if you go on and you get the paywall and you go on on another device, or later mm-hmm. in the day, you get past the paywall. So keep clicking ah, and uh, okay. see what you can do. And uh, otherwise, um, I think Al mentioned last week my review yes, of the Love Show. Yes, I was just about the, to plug that. Yeah, in the new Beatle fan, along with uh, you know lots of interesting stuff about Revolver from um, Al and other people. You, you had a Revolver thing, didn't you? Uh, well, uh, more kind of like a uh, summer of '66 piece uh, on right. the. Uh, uh, it turned. It was going to ri- originally be a scene setter, but Bill ended up running it last in the package for huh. reasons best right. best known. Uh, <laughs> best well, known to, yeah, to, uh, to the, uh, the, uh, the 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 grand high exalted mystic ruler of Beatle fan magazine, Bill King. <laughs> And there's a, a big piece about how the cover came together. There's a yes. there's, it's a really good issue all around. Yeah. Um, otherwise, you can get in contact with me through my Facebook page, just um, either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed, and um, that's about it. And Ken, what do you have? Uh, what surprises do you have on your website and uh, through, every, through every little thing? Well, um, yeah. I know we we actually got a, a really nice email on this show complimenting us about when Chuck Gunderson was on the show. What a great mm-hmm. interview he is. And um, as many of you know, he put out a book called Some Fun Tonight back in 2013, which takes a look at every single North American date the Beatles did from 64 through 66. It really is a perfect companion to go with Live at the Hollywood Bowl and the Ron Howard yes. documentary. So I'm giving away a copy, actually three copies of the book, which has just been reissued in softback form. There's two different volumes. There's one that covers just 1964, and the second covers 65 and 66. So I have three copies, courtesy of Hal Leonard Publishing, uh, to give away in a special contest on my website. And you can find out how to win. The contest starts September 7th, 2016, at uh, KenMichaelsRadio.com. And there's always Beatles trivia every single week where you can win one, one of nine prizes. And in fact, I interviewed Chuck privately, for my show, for every little thing, and you can catch part of that interview on the website as well at kenmichaelsradio.com, and you can also email me at every little thing at att.net. There you go. Okay, and you can uh, contact me on Facebook, uh, Al Sussman, on Twitter at asuss49, uh, and uh, through Beetle Fan Magazine. 
the www.beetlefan.com and uh, also www.paradingpress.com for Changing Times, 101 Days to Shape the Generation. And I think we have, uh, I think we've come to the end of the road for this uh, this edition of uh, of things we said today. And just one other uh, one other note, uh, we are uh, actually rapidly approaching. In fact, it'll be the next show. Will be uh, the two hundredth show in the history of things we said today uh i think uh, if i recall i think uh alan and 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 i joined it right about the halfway mark if i mm-hmm. recall because uh because uh, ken and steve uh originated the show and uh and so did it for the first uh, hundred and something episodes uh and alan and i have been here for uh, it's it's hard to believe that it's been been that long you know mm-hmm. that it's been half 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 the journey and uh we will in the course of the next couple of weeks be taking a look back at the uh at the first uh, 200 shows but as a matter of fact uh actually what will be the the 200th show uh will almost certainly be dealing mainly with 8 days a week mm-hmm. because it'll be just after the uh uh, the theater and Hulu premieres of eight days a week. So we'll be dealing with that. So, but we'll definitely let you know through, uh, through our Facebook page and then other, uh, other sources uh, when we'll be kind of taking a, uh, a look back at the uh, kind of the history of, uh, of things we said today. By the way, if we just, we just, mm-hmm. uh, according to my, Calculations. We just passed our four-year anniversary. Um, four years since this thing started. So really, guys. Mm. So pretty amazing. Uh-huh. Thank you. Yeah, yeah amazing. I know. Amazing, amazing. Thank yeah. you. All. Thank you all out there. Yes, thank you very, very, and yeah, thank you very much for your uh, for your support and all the all the nice comments that we've been getting. Absolutely, we appreciate it very much. And uh, this has been uh, another another quick uh, <laughs> quick discussion. Uh, we we uh, weren't sure if we were going to uh, uh, be covering the entire uh, covering the Hollywood Bowl uh, discussion for the entire show, but of course, as usual, we uh, the four the four big mouths here uh, did uh, did exactly that. <laughs> So anyway, for uh, we again thank you very much for listening, and for Steve Marinucci and Alan Cozen and Ken Michaels, uh, this is Al Sussman saying thanks for listening, and we will see you next time. Mm-hmm.